Uh, today's topic is securing your API. So there was uh, another security topic uh, uh, in the morning. It was an overall look at an organization's uh, security patterns uh, and uh, security architectures. So in this session, we are specifically focusing on APIs. OK? Right. So APIs are everywhere, right, guys? So it is like a big bang thing uh, these days. So it is uh, really important that uh, you know the entry points of your system uh, through the APIs and how to secure them and where the data go and et cetera. Right? So when securing an API, it shouldn't be an uh, uh, afterthought or something you do after the API is developed and designed and everything. Security should be integrated from the very beginning of your design stage. Right? Otherwise, you would be uh, uh, getting many uh, more problems at the end. Or finally, you might even throw out securing the API and go ahead with the functionality, which is very bad. Right? So one of the key things that uh, you want to keep in mind when uh, securing an API is who's going to use your API or who the, who the audience is. So is it used by an end user or an application? Is it a public API? Is it a private API? So depending on these aspects, how you secure, the mechanisms you use to secure will be different. Right? So within this session, what we are trying to do is look at uh, some of the technologies, mechanisms that are available to secure the APIs. Um, so you would uh, have a better knowledge. Uh, you would gain something uh, and uh, apply that to your organization. Right. So these are the attributes of any secure design, not only API. Right? So there are seven attributes. Those are authentication. That means only the legitimate users can access the system. No one else can. Authorization, the system won't allow users to do anything more than what they are supposed to do or allowed to do. Then confidentiality is the data. Sensitive data can be seen by only the intended parties, no one else. Integrity, that means the integrity of the communication uh, or the data is protected uh, within the transaction. So to make sure that no one else messed with the data. Then non-repudiation is uh, someone can't simply deny his or her actions once they are done in an IT communication. The auditing, uh, people do mistakes, so all the anomalies must be recorded and analyzed. Then availability, system should be available for all the legitimate users at all given times. So if you have these attributes in your API, then we can call it as a secured API. So within this session, what we are concentrating, uh, focusing mainly on uh, authentication and authorization aspects. Right? Then we'll briefly go through the others at the very end. OK. HTTP basic authentication. So we all know what this is, right? It's simple username and password based authentication. So GitHub uses that. You can see the GitHub username and password, and you curl it. You, you send this post, and you are authenticated, right? So it is sent as an HTTP basic auth uh, header, username, password, base64 encoded. So this is fine. But the problem is the password basically it, it like goes in clear text, right? It's base64 encoded, but still you can decode it at any time. So a transport level security mechanism like TLS is mandatory if you are using basic authentication. So if a client can't support basic uh, uh, TLS, HTTPS, then it should not be using basic. Then we are coming to the HTTP digest authentication. So remember the limitation in basic code? It, it, it can't uh, survive without uh, transport level security. In digest authentication, the username and password are never sent in clear text. Only a hash value of the password is sent across. Right? So uh, the hash can contain the, the username, password, and uh, a nonce value, and a realm, and some other uh, attributes. So for this mechanism, 
a secured uh, channel, an HTTPS channel, is not required. So even if you, uh, if a client, uh, a client can't talk in, uh, a client can't implement HTTPS, you can use this mechanism to do uh, uh, a secured communication between client and server. All right. Uh, so a quick uh, overview on uh, basic code and digest sort, the, the differences. So basic code sends in clear text. Digest sort sends uh, a hash or a digest derived from uh, the attributes. Then for basic code, TLS is a must. For digest sort, it doesn't depend on TLS. It can survive by its own. And here's a key aspect, uh, 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 important thing. Basic code only performs authentication. The integrity protection is done from the TLS level, from the transport security level. But in digest source, it can perform both authentication and integrity protection. Right? So there's a, a parameter called QOP, quality of protection, which you can send in digest source. If it is auth int, that means authenticate plus integrity protect. Right? So it does both. So when storing, uh, credentials, uh, the password must be stored as a salted hash in your system. In digest or system, it's mainly uh, stored in clear text. You can, so you can rehash it, right? All right. So coming to another traditional mechanism to secure your APIs is TLS mutual authentication. So server and client authenticates using X509 certificates. So this is mostly suitable for a, uh, what we call as a trusted subsystem, right? It can be your uh, internal network, right? So here in this uh, 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 diagram, you can see the end user is trying to access a web app uh, deployed in WC2 application server, which in turn will communicate with the APIs hosted within the same network, right? So if this web app is the entry point to your trusted boundary, then from there onwards, it doesn't need to use the user credentials. It's the, rather, can, uh, it will uh, authenticate using TLS mutual authentication. Right? So this uh, API can be treated as a gateway of an API manager. So it will do the certificate, certificate validation, but it can also do fine grain uh, authorization if required by custom mechanisms. For example, taking the common name coming in the certificate and do more finer grain authorization. Right? So all these three traditional mechanisms can be catered from WSO2 API management platform. So API manager already has a basic auth handler. For digest auth, uh, we can write a custom security handler and plugin. And again, for TLS mutual auth also, we can uh, write a custom security handler uh, to get this done. Okay. So traditional mechanisms are good, and it can be used wherever it is suited. But there is one problem that these mechanisms can't solve. What's that? So all these mechanisms, we call them as direct authentication. They, the uh, the uh, user directly authenticate with the service provider. Right? So uh, what if uh, the user is not authenticating the service provider, but rather another application is authenticating a service provider, authenticating to a service provider on behalf of a user. So who's going to use the service is the application on behalf of a user. So who's going to use this API is an application, right? So these mechanisms can't solve that problem. For example, uh, if we take uh, Twitter, it used to uh, get, a, get users, uh, let's say, Gmail username and password uh, several years back and log into that uh, user's account and find out uh, who, are, who else are in Twitter using uh, uh, a Gmail contact, whether that contact is there in Twitter using Twitter, unless a uh, send friend request or something like that. Right? So it asks for my Gmail username and password or any uh, email provider. So it has full access, right? So even though it says that uh, it won't do anything else with your <laughs> mail, uh, it has full access. So this was a common problem across uh, REST community, right? So it, the key thing is 
acting on behalf of a user. This couldn't be solved from these traditional mechanisms. Right? That's why OAuth came. Okay. So what OAuth tries to solve is, again, how to allow an application to act on behalf of a user without sharing his or her credentials. Right? So in OAuth, uh, so this is the most common protocol that you would encounter in API security. Right? So there are uh, two flavors. One is three-legged OAuth, and another one is the two-legged OAuth. Three-legged means there are uh, three parties. One is the client, that's the app, who's trying to act on behalf of a user. Then the resource server, where the APIs are hosted, the actual resources are residing. And then the actual end user, who's the owner of the resource. Right? Then in two-legged door, there are only two parties, the client and the resource server. Right? For example, uh, for a two-legged door, Example, if they are, uh, let's take a weather API or a stock quote API that doesn't need any uh, uh, acting on behalf of a user, right? Basically, the application authenticates with the weather API and get the weather information and displays on the website. Weather is not provided on behalf of a, uh, for a user, right? In such a scenario where data are, are owned by the app itself, you can use two-legged OAuth. The first uh, version of OAuth was OAuth 1.0. Then there was a vulnerability in that. Then OAuth 1.0a came. Uh, only uh, for a major uh, provider, only Twitter uses it uh, still. All the others have moved to OAuth 2.0. So 1.0a was uh, restrictive. It was uh, hard for the developers because it involved signatures and etc. Uh, so OAuth 2.0. It doesn't depend on the signatures, rather it depends on transport level security for the integrity and confidentiality. Right? So it is a rather a framework than a concrete standard. OAuth 1.0a was kind of a strict standard. Right? OAuth 2.0 is a framework in which you can cater custom use cases using the OAuth framework. Right? So there are a lot of what we call as OAuth profiles out there. Right, who's taking OAuth provisions and catering to use different use cases. So these use cases, we call them as grant types in OAuth world. Okay. So these are the four main grant types in the OAuth specification. So one is authorization code grant. So basically think of it as a use case. This use case is uh, a web application is trying to act on behalf of a user, right? We are a server, uh, uh, client to server communication. Then implicit grant is suitable for mobile and single page applications and other untrusted public apps, right? Where uh, a client, uh, there's something called a client ID and a secret, uh, using which the client authenticates to the uh, server. So in those, applications like a single page app, you can't keep the client secret because it's, they are plain uh, in the browser, right? Anyone can read that. So in such a situation, in such a use case, implicit grant is the one that you can use. Then resource owner credentials grant, that's basically, uh, uh, it's like the basic code. Uh, it gets the username and password and then sends it across to the authorization server and gets authorized, right? So uh, the people who have been using basic OAuth so far, they can switch to OAuth and use that grant type to cater the same requirement. So this is suitable for, uh, let's say, uh, uh, official apps of an uh, uh, authorization server. So Facebook has an official Facebook app. So it is fine to give your Facebook username and password to the Facebook app, right? So it is trusted because it is from Facebook itself. In such a scenario, Resource owner credential grant is fine. Then client credentials grant is the previous example I mentioned about this weather APIs and stock API, where it's too suitable to retrieve data that is not specific to an end user. Okay. 
So out of these four, what is most recommended if if it can be done in your scenario, uh, in your use case, is authorization code grant. It is the, uh, it is the most secure grant type of uh, these four. So here's a quick uh, look at how authorization code grant flow works. So there's a client, then there's the API gateway, this can be WS2 API gateway. Then uh, API gateway is front in the actual API. And then there's an O2 authorization server which will grant what we call as an OAuth token, and then an Active Directory, uh, which is plugged to the OAuth server. So what happens is, user first tries to access a client. Now client wants to get some data of user from an API and show them to the user on the web page. Right? So what client will do is, on the second step, it will do a redirect to the O2 authorization server in API manager case to API manager or WS2 INT server, right? Now there, then in third step, user will authenticate at the authorization server. Authorization server will send back something called authorization code back to the client. Why, an, why a code is sent rather than a token? This is not the access token, right? Let's, uh, let's look at that after we discuss the full flow. Then what it will do is, is it will give the authorization code back to the authorization server and request a access token. So that fifth communication is a back-channel communication. The previous one, 302s, are browser-based. Right? So why a code was needed? Since it's browser-based, because uh, authorization server needs to get the user authenticated using a browser, right? it can't send an access token in the browser because it can be seen. Access token is not meant to be seen even by the end user who is authorizing. It is given to an application, right? So that is why only a temporary code is given once user authorized, uh, only a code is given to the client, then client will send the code to the authentic server. Server can find out the authenticated user's details and create this token and give that token to the client in back channel call. So token is never seen from the user. So that's why this is a secured mechanism. Right? So once client get the access token, it will give it uh, to the API gateway with the request, right? send in an HTTP bear header. API gateway will call authorization server to validate that, asking whether it's a valid token. Server will tell yes, valid. And it might also give some additional information on the, ser on the about the user to the API gateway. So gateway can do further authorizations if required, right? like SACML or any fine-grained authorization. Finally, if the token is valid, uh, it will allow the client to access the API on behalf of that user. Right? Okay. So that's the uh, main O2O flow. Okay. So using O2, there are very interesting uh, uh, use cases that we can build up. Now usually, in the previous one, this authorization server and the resource server is one. So authorization is done at the server where our APIs are maybe hosted, right? But uh, let's think about a different scenario in which user is coming from, uh, let's say, uh, Google. Right? So user account is at Google. Now we need to decouple the user authentication from the authorization server. Because authorization server doesn't know about this user. User is from Google, not from uh, the authorization server's user store. Right? So in that case, when the user, uh, when the client calls the authorization server, redirects the authorization server to get the user authenticated, right? authorization server will redirect the user to the actual INT provider, in this case, Google. Right? User will authenticate there. So this is federation. This is a federation pattern. Right? User will authenticate there and send a valid response uh, to the authentic server. Now server will uh, act as before. It will simply uh, create a uh, code and send back to the client. Client will send the code back and get a token, and the communication will happen. So we have decoupled the authorization server and the actual identity provider, right? 
So here's another pattern. O2 has another grant type called SAML grant type. So usually, uh, SAML is kind of the mostly used uh, protocol up to now for single sign-on. Right? So let's think your web app already has a, a SAML communication happening, and the user is already authenticated to the web app using SAML. Now web app wants to access an API on behalf of this user. Right? Now what, uh, in previous steps, in the auth flow, user needs to get authenticated. So should the uh, client sends the user back to that uh, authorization server and get the user authenticate, authenticated again. So thinking about the user experience, user needs to authenticate twice. So what if we can use the SAML token and get an access token? Because authentication is already there, right? User has already authenticated. That's where SAML bearer grant types come in, comes into picture. So once a uh, user is authenticated, and a SAML token in step three is given to the application server where the client is running. Client can then, uh, yeah. Client can then on the fourth flow uh, send a SAML grant type request to the authorized server. Basically, it will send the SAML token to the uh, auth server and get an access token uh, exchanged uh, for the SAML token. Right. So these are widely used use case. Uh, in API security. Similarly, if the authentication mechanism is now OpenID Connect, OpenID Connect sends a JWT, you can send the JWT and get an access token, exchange uh, uh, for that. Right. Then uh, let's think uh, your environment is a Windows environment. So you are already authenticated to, the, to your Windows domain, right? So to access an API, the user doesn't want to authenticate again. Right? That's a valid use case. And we have a grant type for that. That is the NTLM grant type. So if the user is already authenticated to the Windows domain, authorization server or WSO2 API manager or the ID server is capable to grab the Windows authentication and provide an access token on behalf of the user. Okay. So all these grant types, SAML, JWT and NTLM are already uh, out of the box supported in the WSO2 API management platform. Okay, then there's a, uh, another grant type called chain grant type. In here, uh, what, what it's doing is uh, the first API that receives a request wants to access another API downstream on behalf of the same user. So the first uh, the first resource server can't use the same token to access the other resource server because that token is owned, it is given to the client, not to the resource server. So resource server will send that uh, token to the authorization server and get a new token for himself on behalf of that user. So this also can be done, uh, but using a, a, a custom uh, grant type. Uh, we have done that already for a few customers. Okay. So we are coming to a topic called token introspection. What basically it does is, here you can see uh, the API or the gateway will call the authorization server to validate the access token and get user information. Right? Up to now, this communication was a proprietary mechanism. What token introspection does is to standardize that. Right? So basically, a WC API manager can uh, call, uh, API gateway can call any other non WSO2 uh, key manager or authorization server to get the uh, access token validated. It doesn't, uh, up to, uh, so far it has been only within WSO2. Now, API manager can go beyond that and get the token validated. Okay. So once a token is received from, uh, from the gateway, gateway can call a SACML PDP for fine-grained authorization. Right? So delegated authorization is done by OAuth, then SACML authorization can be used for fine-grained authorization. Okay. Finally, coming to another interesting topic called user-managed access, 
So I'm already out of time, so let me quickly uh, go through this. So Oath used to be the, this big thing when it came out, right? Now the big thing is user-managed access. Oath tried to solve the problem where a client tries to uh, access an API on behalf of a user. Uma tries to solve the problem where a person uh, delegates to another person. Previously, it a person delegated to a client app. Right? So simple example is Google Drive. You can create a doc, and you give view access to a person, edit access to another person, and etc. It's a proprietary mechanism of Google. Uma is trying to standardize that, one of its goals, among many others. Right? So this is particularly in in interesting in IoT, where uh, uh, IoT devices are uh, uh, around uh, everywhere. So uh, this can create a lot of use cases uh, on IoT. So UMA is based on OAuth, right? It's just a solution that tries to solve something OAuth itself couldn't do. So there are um, uh, several APIs that were introduced, like protection API, authorization API, and several tokens, protection API token, authorization API token, and requesting party token. Everything is same, like resource server, authorization server, client, everything, OAuth concepts. Only additional thing is requesting party. There's another person asking another person to delegate access to him. Right? So that's the uh, next big thing. So we have already developed that as a Google Summer of Code project, and we are reviewing that, so it will be included in a future release. There are only very few implementation on UMA, because it's still an ongoing specification. OK, so finally, the other five uh, attributes. Confidentiality can be maintained from using a transport level security or JSON web encryption. For integrity, again, transport level security and JSON web signature. Non-repudiation, JSON web signature. Auditing needs to be done using the audit logs and uh, using analytics for fraud and threat detection. So WS2 already has an analytics framework uh, for that. And availability uh, needs to be handled at network level using uh, hardware devices or uh, uh, applications and using throttling, like client level throttling and user level throttling. So if a user is trying to bombard the system, throttle him out. Right? OK. So uh, it was a quick session uh, covering a lot of things. I hope you uh, gained a, a good understanding on the mechanisms that are available for securing the...